Here's Aniko calling in. Hey Aniko, how are you doing? Hello, Kani. I was just pouring uh, pouring some coffee. I thought this is a Bolivian blend, but I know they're having a, a real hard time there with uh, climate change hitting coffee production. What what how's it there, and what what do you think? Coffee drinking is fairly new in Nepal. Um, the first coffee shop in Kathmandu only opened in 1999, 21 years ago, from Himalayan Java. Oh, look. So I have the co- have my coffee from there now. But that was 21 years ago. And now in just Kathmandu and the neighboring city of Lalitpur, there is more than 5,000 coffee shops. My so goodness. coffee drinking has really taken off in what we used to be more of a tea drinking country. Um, but a lot of the coffee growing is really recent. Generally, coffee wouldn't be growing. North-facing slopes with beautiful views of the Himalaya in some places. Of the Himalayan mountains that are gradually uh, losing snow and ice cover over time. I know. Climate change is really happening in this region. That's a good segue then into our discussion on, um, you know, for me, it's fascinating the work that uh, you've been helping us with um, on uh, on the third pole. But maybe uh, to start with, maybe a little bit uh, to explain um, what exactly is the deep concern uh, with the third pole, uh, so that uh, and, and what are we referring to here? Um, you know, the the largest storage of frozen water on Earth is in Antarctica, where virtually the entire continent is covered in ice, and and the second largest is in the Arctic, including both floating ice over the ocean, but also quite a large ice cap over Greenland and over some of the Siberian and Canadian islands. The third largest storage of frozen water on Earth is in the in the high mountain area of, of Asia. Uh, that's the Tibetan Plateau and the mountain ranges that surround the Tibetan Plateau. Um, people also refer to it as the water tower of Asia. For the last several decades, there's been significant warming at high altitudes. And actually the warming increases with altitude. And so uh, we've been seeing, with the exception of uh, small regions in the Karakoram, Western Kunlun and Eastern Pamir, everywhere else, the glaciers have been retreating, the snow cover has been decreasing. So the amount of frozen water has been um, has been decreasing. And this is a trend that will continue regardless of what climate scenario we go in. Are you saying, Aniko, that if we, even if we go with capping global average temperatures at, at 1.5 degrees Celsius, that's not going to be enough to save uh, these glaciers? It will not be enough. Uh, one thing is a global average temperature increase of 1.5 above pre-industrial still means 1.8 to 2.2 in the higher mountain regions. Right. And. The projections right now are with that, we would lose about a third of the glacier volume throughout the region, maybe the eastern Himalaya even closer to half. This will have a lot of downstream consequences. Uh, as I mentioned, these uh, the glaciers are a big source of water supply in the dry season. So hydropower, drinking water, agriculture are all affected. As the glaciers retreat, they leave behind depressions that fill with water. These are called glacial lakes. And the number of these has been increasing. Many of them have been growing really rapidly. And every couple of years, there's a glacial lake outburst flood. Because this is a a lake that's stored behind relatively loose, gravelly hills, the moraines at the end of the glacier. They're very unstable. And if a rockfall falls into the glacier or something else happens that disturbs it, yeah. You can have a dam burst and the entire glacier. You know, you also brought up the point of uh, black carbon, and I'm not sure everyone understands this problem. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? The main driver of warming globally is carbon dioxide, right. which is a greenhouse gas that once emitted from burning fossil fuels or from deforestation stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. It's a long-lived climate forcer. There's also substances that, once they're emitted in the atmosphere, don't stay there very long, but still have a climate impact. And black carbon is one of those. It's a short-lived climate pollutant. Black carbon itself is the the really dark soot particles that come out of incomplete combustion. You see it coming out of diesel trucks that are badly maintained, out of brick kilns, 
out of industrial boilers. Um, some of it comes out of cooking fires. Do you see that around you sometimes? Uh, well, black carbon is very visible. Yeah. You see it when you're standing next to a diesel truck, but it also creates a dark haze. Right. In the atmosphere, it absorbs sunlight and warms the air. But when it deposits onto snow and ice surfaces, uh, it darkens them and they absorb more sunlight. And so it helps melt them all as well. Yeah. And it helps melt white surfaces. Yeah. So it accelerates yeah. the melting. Um, the same activities that emit a lot of the fossil fuels and black carbon and other short of pollutants are also responsible for severe air pollution problems. Air pollution kills about 7 million people a year. Right. Two, two thirds of those in Asia. Two thirds of the 7 million. Did you just say two thirds of the 7 million are in Asia? Right. Wow. Okay, I didn't know that. That's a big number. Um, changes in monsoon affect uh, agriculture, food supply, affect um, the occurrence of floods, of landslides. We've had an extremely wet start to the monsoon this year, and we've already lost 18 bridges in Nepal alone. We've had $100 million of damage to hydropower plants. Um, it's unusual. Is, is it changes driven by climate change? Possibly. Possibly a few other factors as well. The, there's more damage because there's more infrastructure, but it's, the infrastructure is also in places where people didn't really think that the monsoon might be changing. Right. What needs to be accelerated? I, I would like to shift to that now. So adaptation is really, really important. There's a lot of people, especially the, the poor, more marginalized, marginalized people who are extremely vulnerable. We need to have better knowledge, better data, better forecasting systems, better warning systems. Uh, we need to understand this really complex landscape in this region better to understand what places are vulnerable to landslides, to floods. We need to be able to warn people. And we also need to be able to have um, systems and resources in place to help people rebuild from the inevitable disasters that people will be facing. Ooh. You're from Sri Lanka. You can build a seawall to deal with one meter climate, uh, one meter sea level rise, but you cannot adapt to 70 meters that sea level rise if all of Antarctica were to melt. Absolutely. So mitigation to stop climate change is essential globally. And those tsunamis are going to keep coming. You know, this is, uh, you're right. You can't, uh, you can't build a wall uh, for, for that type of extreme uh, weather situations. But what type of mitigation measures would you uh, be recommending, Aniko? One that we absolutely cannot avoid is reducing emissions of carbon dioxide. With reducing right. consumption of fossil fuels, we need to go to net zero carbon dioxide emissions or even work towards drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere again. But that's not enough. Because carbon dioxide, once emitted into the atmosphere, is there for a long, long time, there's starting points at all levels, at the level of the individual. Right. We have a certain responsibility for what we consume, how much meat we eat, whether we drive a diesel or petrol car or an electric car, um, how much plastic we consume, what our travel choices are during our vacations. At the local government level, there's also a lot that can be done from uh, banning certain activities, from promoting walkable cities where people don't rely on their motorbikes or their cars for going on, but of providing better public transport. At the national level, there's a lot that can be done to set up taxes and incentives to reduce or remove fossil fuel subsidies wherever those exist. It's a regional and a global problem, and we do need very strong global bodies coordinating action. Looking at all of this, what is in your mind literally the toughest hill to climb, not to pun on that, maybe the toughest glacier to climb? to get to where we want to get. With some disasters like an earthquake, it happens with a bang. There is no question that we had a disaster and everyone picks up the pieces and rebuilds. But with climate change, we have a slow motion disaster taking place right. that the changes are happening over longer time periods than, the, than election cycles. The solutions have longer time frames, and it's very easy to ignore it for a day, for a week, for a year. Or for a five-year election cycle. It's also, it requires a lot of rethinking, kind of rethinking what to aspire for. Yeah. But also, in some ways, this year, this past year or two has been really eye-opening for a lot of people with 
uh, climate change related disasters from fires in California and Australia to actually really bad forest fires in the Himalaya this past yeah. March, April. That's right. Um, to extremely heavy floods at the, right at the start of the monsoon. If we can get our children and grandchildren across the world to reimagine their future and to say there's a different way in which we, we can live and live with nature uh, and prosper and, and have everyone uh, at a level of well-being that makes, uh, makes them happy, uh, that would uh, be a, a huge start. And, and I think you're right that uh, as a UN system as a whole, that's something I think as a message we need to powerfully and boldly advocate. But uh, thank you, Aniko. It's been wonderful talking with you. And I hope that wonderful uh, Himalayan coffee that you have there continues to grow and thrive uh, on the northern face. But enjoy your coffee. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.